Hello everybody, John here, and today on To The Garage, we're doing a full service. on our Abarth 595 called Snoopy. Hi everyone. So if you're unfamiliar with our channel, To The Garage, we cover all manner of tinkering and playing around in your garage. My absolute passion is the Jaguar XK8, but we've got all sorts of other vehicles in our family, including this Abarth 595. And we're gonna do a service on this car today. If you're interested in this, then you'll probably be interested in all our other videos. So please consider subscribing to the channel. It costs nothing and helps the channel to grow. So what are we going to do today? We're going to do a full service. Um, we've had the Arbar for a little over a year and done a fair number of miles in it. So I'm going to give it a full home service. I've bought a selection of items in a range of brands. They're brands that appeal to me. Um, I'm not a person who needs things to be absolutely original equipment. I'm privileged in my day job to be able to work in a lot of car parts manufacturing companies. And so I'm very aware that OE just really means in a lot of cases, the box. In some cases, it means a big difference. But there are some really great brands out there and some things you do not need to spend so much money on. So they're very much my choice. We're gonna go for obviously an oil change. And I am using genuine Arbath Selenia oil. So this is 10W50. Uh, our Arbath is a turbocharged 1.4, and this is the correct oil for the job. It is a little more expensive than some comparative oils I could have bought. I uh, just thought I would give this a whirl because it is OE. So we're gonna see how that works out. Four liters is what I've bought, and that did cost me a little over 60 pounds in the UK. Air filter, we're switching from the standard paper to a fit once filter. So this is a lifetime filter, a K&N, and it's a 3014, and these are oiled cotton filters. Uh, they do allow potential for more airflow, Changing this alone probably won't make any improvement to most cars. The Arbath is a little more tuned than some, and it does have easy potential for upgrade. So this will kind of future-proof against needing to draw more air. And I do like the brand, and I have had experience of them before. The KN filter cost about £35 in the UK. Um, we've got a cabin filter. This is a Febby Bilstein item, and it's basically a charcoal impregnated cotton filter. My experience of these is they really come in two qualities. Um, OE contains carbon or charcoal, um, this does. Um, some of the aftermarket stuff is just folded paper. So, so as long as it's containing some carbon, it's gonna be as good as OE and that cost about seven pounds in the UK. I've got an oil filter. On this car, it's an element only. You don't actually get the case. So it's a drop-in cartridge, if you like. Um, and I've gone for Blueprint, which is a popular brand in the UK of aftermarket pattern parts. And this is folded filter paper in a housing. Again, you spend more, you don't necessarily get better, um, but your choice. That would be very cheap. That is about five pounds. I know that the rear discs and pads on this car need changing, so I've ordered these in. I've got some new pads and they are Brembo brand. This car could have a Brembo brake disc 
and caliper option when new. Um, this does not have it. So these are not a different style, they're just Brembo brand. I'm not upgrading the calipers to Brembo style. And likewise, the discs I've gone for in Brembo brand. It's a brand I trust. Um, I know where it's good quality. It's not the only brand that I use for discs. Uh, EBC, I think, for me, is the best upgrade brand. Brembo is excellent for standard, or if you have Brembo branded calipers, sometimes you have no options. Um, so not the cheapest, but I'm okay with spending that. And this combination will have cost me around £70 in the UK. And then I've got a set of windscreen wipers just for the front. My windscreen wipers are not actually worn out, but occasionally they collide with each other. I'll talk more about that in the future. But um, yeah, so I've gone for a really good brand, which I know is going to have accurate measurements on it. So I've gone for Bosch and these cost £22 in the UK for the front set. Well, I'm going to start with the easiest job on the service, and that is to change the wipers. It's always a good idea to give your window a clean, particularly when you're going to mess around with your wipers because you'll tend to wipe the screen dry. It's not raining uh, or forget to squirt it. And all the dust and rubbish that sat on there can potentially scratch the screen. So just a good workshop habit. You don't have to be perfect. After all, you're going to use windscreen wipers on it in a moment. But yeah, give the windscreen a wipe over with a wet cloth. Now the windscreen wipers on this car actually represent one of the few things that has literally been wrong. Uh, it's not a bit of failure, but certainly not good. If the wipers are being turned on for the first time in any particular day, sometimes the tip of the longer wiper will collide with the tail on the shorter wiper. And I think part of that is these are what they call aero blades, so uh, all one piece molded extrusions. They're quite flexible. And they move around a little bit, and this one drags behind, and they get tangled up because this gap is not quite big enough. I've always had my suspicions that the blades that are fitted are probably um, correct for the model according to their manufacturer, but the manufacturer hasn't been too careful in specifying the right lengths. They'll, they'll be selected from a standard range and those will fit. It may not happen, but let's give it a chance, see if I can show you the issue. You can actually hear the wiper clipping the back edge of the short one. So this collision is happening here, about there on the screen. And sometimes they do tangle properly and bounce and make a hell of a noise. Another really minor issue is this blade doesn't actually touch the screen when at rest on this edge. When I was looking around for the correct wipers, I noted that various brands said they could offer them. Um, but what was quite interesting was Original Equipment and Bosch both showed 340 millimeters as the length of the shorter wiper. Some of the other brands showed 345 or even 350, which again suggests that they are just selecting the closest blade from their standard ranges. Removing these blades is a doddle. Um, they are not the most common form of attachment, it has to be said, but there's a little square on the back of the wiper arm. You press through that square and then just pull the entire item out and give it a wiggle. And there you are. That comes off. You're just depressing. Uh, it's pretty against the car. You can see better. You're depressing this square and releasing it. So now let's compare them with the Bosch 
replacements. Completely different curve. And this one, I said, wasn't curved enough. That one is more curved. It really is quite extreme. Let's look at the lengths. So if I flatten these out, uh, you're going to have to take my word, I'm lining the ends up. So if I straighten these, we can see is that the Bosch appears maybe five millimeters longer. However, if you note where the bracket is, it's entirely different. So to get a true length, I'll bring that back so that these two square pieces line up. And then when we look at the end, we'll say they are the same. So the same length that way, but the Bosch has actually added five mil to the other end of the wiper. Let's do the same with the short blade. Overall length, overall the Bosch is, I would say nearly 10 mil shorter. Uh, but again, if we line up the square sections, it's maybe five mil shorter at this end. And the piece that collides is also a little shorter. So it's basically the positioning of the hinge part that is making a difference. And this is going to give me an extra bit of clearance of three to four mil, I would say. Simplicity itself to fit. Touching the screen, the whole length of the wiper. Let's put this much flatter Bosch on. Very good fitting system. Probably just means that the wiper blades are a little bit more expensive than some. And I have this more satisfying gap between the two blades at rest. Let's hope that translates into a good situation when they're wiping. Okay, so now we're going to have a crack at the rear brakes. These covers can be completely tricksy to get off. There is a little gap, uh, keyhole slot, whatever you want to call it, and it is at the bottom of the Scorpion. Just a little slot there. This is a little homemade tool I find very, very useful. It's just a fork bent to various angles, and I can get the little short tangs behind there and get some good purchase. And off she flies. These have got a puzzle nut on one wheel nut if it's in the UK. So I'm gonna go in the boot and find that out. So there's our puzzle nut. That goes on and you turn it till it locates. And then this impact gun has got a very low setting. So I'm using very gentle force. There we go. Okay, wheel appears stuck. That's quite common. The um, hub and the alloy wheel are different materials and so you can get a little bit of dissimilar metal corrosion. Sometimes it's gonna need a lot of tugging. Sometimes you gotta whack it on the back with a rubber mallet. Um, it will come off. It just might take a little while, longer than you'd like. So get myself in my seat. They're pretty stuck. Heavy rubber mallet. Moving now. 
far, still very stuck. Uh, it's tightest there, so let's just do that like that. I'll pop something in the gap I've created at the top. My special fork tool, for instance. That should lever it off. But this is what's caused the issue and we will make sure that that doesn't repeat. So here's the front of the disc and we're just looking over the back and the caliper has two slide pins, one here, one here. There's a cable here, which is a wear indicator, just been hooked into the bleed nipple cover. Don't know if that's a standard way of doing things, but I'll just undo it for now. Put a 13 millimeter spanner on the slide pin nut and Undoing that should be relatively easy. You can bang it with the palm of your hand, it'll probably go, but I'm too old and creaky and worried about my health to, to start bashing spanners with my hands. You can do all sorts of harm. Now that they're loose, you can put a 17 mil spanner on the flats this side of the caliper and that will hold the whole slide pin arrangement still whilst you undo the nut properly. And out she comes. One, and repeat on the bottom. Just a note, Unless you want to be very frustrated, make sure that your handbrake is off if you're going to change pads or discs because the handbrake equally operates the caliper and you ain't going nowhere while that's on. You can just wriggle the caliper now those pins are out. They pass through this hole. Gives them a little wriggle and off comes the caliper. Now normally if I was working on my Jag, I'd be hanging this from a bungee cord, but it's an Arbath. These are very light and there's a handbrake cable holding things in place. So actually they're going nowhere. Pads are here and just pull straight out. They're in little stainless steel clips in the carrier. There's a lot of metal embedded, I reckon Although there is definitely more life left in those, they've lost about a third of their material, in my opinion. Okay. Now the inner pad has that wire attached to it. So we're just tracking that back through this clip. to find where it disconnects. The answer is behind this little bracket, so just out of your line of sight, unfortunately. But I'll bring it out to show you. So that's attached to the brake pad. And this yellow part is attached to the car. So let's just unhook this clippy arrangement as well get that cable out. A little pad can be withdrawn. Like so. Now we want to remove this disc and as you can see this this carrier is in the way. So we're going to be removing the carrier and then we've got these guide pins which should just unscrew. Now at this stage, if this was a Fiat 500, all we would be doing is undoing this bolt here, which has a Allen head or socket head or hex head, depending on where you are in the world, uh, and this one here. But because it's in our bath and things are a little bit modified, you can't get line of sight to this. So instead, you're going to have to remove the four big nuts here, I think there's 17s, I could be wrong, 
um, but hold the hub and bearing onto the carrier and then you'll be able to get at these. Having finally wrestled this carrier out, you can clean up these stainless clips unless you have some new ones and obviously just use those. But as they are stainless steel, they will generally clean up very well. give you back a decent surface for your pads to slip on. And with that carrier all removed, you can take the disc straight off. I've got this back to front at the moment. It's just more convenient for me. When you remove these hubs, there's a speed sensor wire going into the back, so be careful of that. You don't want to break that. Because we had trouble getting the wheel off, and the disc for that matter, make sure you clean up this hub properly and this surface and get rid of any imperfections and blemishes. And I would put a little bit of copper slip around the nose part. This I would keep completely dry. The copper. Copper grease is really good for brake parts. Don't get it anywhere near the braking surfaces, though, pads or discs. But it's good for putting on the hub nose like this. It will prevent the dissimilar materials of the hub and the wheel bonding together. And for lots of people, it's the go-to substance to put on the back of their brake pads, the back plates, never the front, between the back plate and the piston to prevent or at least reduce brake squeal. Here's our old heat affected, scored, big lip and corroded surface discs. And here's our nice new machined ones. And before we do anything with these, they need thoroughly cleaning with brake cleaner to get rid of the protective wax that will be all over them. So, as I said in some of my other videos, with brake cleaner, it's just a very volatile solvent. As long as it works, there's not really good and bad brands of brake cleaner. So uh, buy what you can buy plenty of so that you're not mean with it. And I'll just use these two spiky pins to hold it in place. So it doesn't flop around until the hub is properly fitted again. There we go. I will be giving this another clean before I put the pads in contact with it. Next I'm going to reinstall the carrier. Okay, that's our carrier fitted. Now we'll get the hub back onto its suspension arm.
Okay, so the hub is now reattached. Just going to grab my is it a 12? Not sure. Yeah, 12 mil spanner. I just nip up these two locating spikes. There we go. Make sure that the back plate, this bit, isn't touching anything. That's all good. Not going to risk that I haven't mauled this whilst trying to wrestle everything into position. So a little bit more on this exposed surface. The other side is obviously protected by the back plate, so I couldn't have touched it. Next thing to do, this has to be wound back. So this piston has to be screwed backwards and pushed back at the same time. And then, because otherwise you won't be able to get the pads in and it acts as your self adjustment for your handbrake. So we've used this tool to wind this caliper backwards. So screwing it whilst pushing it back into the caliper body itself. That's a caliper wind back tool and is necessary when you've got your handbrake actuation or self adjust actuation if it uses a rotary action on the piston. Trying to break the seal on the Brembo's and we want one pad with and one pad without the sensor on it. And the one with the sensor on it, the sensor cable goes through the caliper so, and then this pad is going to go on the back of the disc. So that just gets squoze into place in between the stainless steel runners that we've previously cleaned up, like that. And then the new front pad, i just do a quick compare thickness. So it actually used about half of the pad, probably. Put a new one in there like that. Lovely. And then these don't have a rubberized pad on the back, so it is possible that some sort of squealing sounds will emerge. So at the points where the caliper is going to touch here and here, it's a good idea to put a bit of copper slip, just like so. Obviously I don't get anywhere near the braking surface. And this should prevent any brake squeal. I'm going to do the same on the back and put it on the piston where it's going to touch the, the other brake pad. Okay, now we can put the caliper back on. And then we've got there two bolts that hold the caliper onto the sliders. There's the other. This wire, I'm just going to hook it back to the bleed nipple cover, which is where it was before. I'll remind us all at the end, but please remember when you're doing a job like this, where you've wound back your calipers, first time you hit the brakes, they probably won't work. So you need to pump your pedal and your handbrake to get things working again. As with always, working on brakes is actually a lot simpler than most people imagine. However, if you're in the slightest bit lacking confidence or concerned, then get a professional to do it. It's your life at stake. I'm not telling you to do your own brakes. I'm just showing you me doing my brakes. The brakes on this are bath should be what I would call a simple change. And if it was a Fiat 500, they would have been. 
But having to remove the hub, as I did, moved it into a different league because I needed penetrant oil, I needed heat, uh, I used an impact gun, all sorts of things to loosen off those rather large and um, never before removed. Let's, let's get this cable reconnected, which is the brake sensor. This will put a light on on your dashboard when your brake pad has worn down to a particular level and exposes a metal contact inside the pad. We are now nearly there. Let's finish this job off by putting the wheel back. And we'll tighten those up properly once we've got the car on the ground. Now we want to change the oil. So first thing first, got to remove the under tray from the engine. That's a series of 10 mil bolts, which we'll just zip out. And this is number six. Down she comes. Now we're going to remove the sump plug, which is seventeen millimeter. There is a copper washer up there, but it may well lighten this one of combined itself with the aluminium and stuck, so it might not be obvious. It's a good idea to get that off and replace it with a new one. There we go. Got a new washer on my sump plug. Pop that back in and tighten it back up. So initially it might not seem worth cleaning up if your sump's dirty, um, particularly as you're going to cover it up with an under tray. It's a really good idea to make this area really clean. That way, if there are any leaks, you'll see them. Can now reinstall my under tray. <laughs> to access the oil filter on an abaf, you have to remove this air intake pipe, this air pipe. So, I'm going to unhook this clip. Apologies, the uh, camera decided to pack up <laughs> and I didn't realize. Um, so, I removed that pipe. I had to cut the uh, bands, the clips here, and where it goes onto the turbo and replace them with standard Jubilee style clips. Uh, but pull this off and that gives you just about enough access with an extension to get to the oil filter housing, which is straight down there, plastic housing, so not very tight. Undo that, unscrew it and pull out the cartridge and the cover. New cartridge in, in, air pipe back on. So, all secure. Now going to Put some oil in. Got my oil pouring jug, which I much prefer to pouring it straight from the cans using the Arbath Selena 
10W50. The little pull tab is torn off. It's not a good start for rather an expensive can of oil. My jug holds half a litre. And is much better for pouring than any of the plastic jugs I've otherwise experienced. A funnel would do the job but I like this because I can keep a track on how much I'm putting in. Okay. So four pours from this is two litres. For the air filter, we need a seven millimetre socket. Loosen off the bolts on the Scorpion emblazoned airbox top. It looks like a rocker cover, but it isn't. A little bit more. There we go. Lift from the front edge and pull forward. It's just hooked into place. And here we can see standard air filter and air flows through there into the air box at the top and then down there into the engine not too dirty looks like it's been reasonably well looked after get a k and n filter these are oiled cotton and are supplied pre-oiled and ready to go. And as it's an oil filter, be careful not to maul it too much and you get it out of the bag. The pink area is cotton trapped between metal gauze and that cotton is soaked in an oil which basically grabs any debris from the air. Pop that into position and then reinstall our lid. And because not always will you be the person working on your car possibly, uh, they give you this little sticker so that you can stick it somewhere near the filter housing so that a, a garage won't throw that air filter away. There we go. So now it's time to change the cabin air filter. So on my UK spec car, we are going into the driver's footwell, get a Torx bit, and it's a T20 for there. And that isn't the Torx or an Allen bolt, Allen bolt, I think. That is five mil. It's a very strange arrangement. This moulding is your footrest. It's a recess more than it's a footrest. And then we can release all of this. Unfortunately, I don't have video footage of this, but there's a ribbed section at the back of the heater and there are two seven millimeter bolt heads. 
one's up here, one's down diagonally opposite at the back. You remove both of those and remove a rectangular plastic ribbed cover. Once you've got this out, the element is behind it and you just pull it out and slot the new one in. Access is awful and that's why so few actually get changed. Well, that's completed the service on our 595. It was about six hours work, mainly because of uh, the rear hubs having to be removed from the suspension arms. If you're enjoying our channel, then don't forget to subscribe and click the little bell icon so you get notifications of new videos. And please give us a thumbs up or thumbs down and you can share the videos. And below the video is always the area where you can comment and get involved with the chat.